Um, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Adam Smith Institute. Uh, particularly for those of whom uh, this is your first visit to the Institute, uh, we welcome you. We hope to see you again at another event. Uh, it's great to see so many new faces. Um, I was a bit, little bit worried that the fire department would shut us down with the number of people, although I thought the silver lining would be that we could prove to Owen that we do have a point on some things. Um, <laughs> the Adam Smith Institute, for those, for those of you who don't know, is a free market libertarian think tank. We believe in free markets and free people. Um, I'm sure we can all agree on at least half of those things here. Um, and we do work in the media through publications, through events like these, and through kind of general media advocacy uh, to spread kind of classical liberal ideas. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome tonight Owen Jones, who probably doesn't need much of an introduction, uh, but I'll try and give him a small one anyway. He's a columnist for The Guardian and for The New Statesman. He uh, is the winner of the Young Writer Award um, for his book Chavs, which is a number one smash hit. You have certainly seen it if you haven't read it yourself in every bookshop in the country. Um, you probably, like me, have lots and lots of apolitical friends who've read it, and for whom this is kind of one of the few th kind of entries into politics they've had. And that, I think, is the sort of genius of Owen Jones, is that he brings ideas to uh, debates where ideas kind of usually don't, don't work so well. And he's, a, he's an ideas man. And I think that's why we at the Adam Smith Institute, even if we don't agree with all of his ideas, are really, really interested in what he has to say and really encouraged by the fact that he has had so much success pushing ideas, not pushing kind of party politics. So without further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to him for where libertarians on the left can agree. It might be a short speech. But <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. Um, comrades! <laughs> I mean, who is trolling who? I can't quite work out the dynamic here. There's actually been a terrible misunderstanding. I thought I was coming to the John Smith Institute. So you will have to bear with me. Um, no, but seriously, I will have you nationalising the means of production by the end of the night. But it's, it's a real... It's a real honour to be here, and it's, it's very generous indeed of the Adam Smith Institute to, uh, to invite me here. And I suppose for me, you know, what I, I set up this YouTube video uh, channel a few months ago, and, and the reason I did that is because often I have to go on telly and babble in a semi-coherent way, as I'm sure you've all yelled at the TV screen occasionally, <laughs> my half-baked lefty nonsense. And, um, but, but it's quite a confrontational format, and you know, you, you get social media, it's a bit like been back at school, which doesn't take much imagination if you have a face like mine, uh, but where, where people are kind of going, fight, 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 fight. And uh, what I like, actually, because bizarrely I don't like arguing very much, so I've chosen the worst occupation on earth. But I like chatting to people. I like listening to people with very different ideas and engaging with ideas. So I've done these interviews with people like Peter Hitchens and Douglas Carswell and Jacob Rees-Mogg and we're not, you know, we don't agree on everything, it's fair to say, but I find it fascinating being able to just sit there and, and chat in a reasonable, non-confrontational uh, manner. And I suppose that's the spirit in which I'm, I'm here. And, and that's the problem with social media. I think it has its place, of course, it has its place. Uh, but I think sometimes, you know, because you can't see each other face to face. And people communicate, I think, in a, a rather different way when you can't see the other person. And, you know, I think this brings a bit more humanity into politics, which is what I think is, is often lacking. You know, I mean, people often quite, you know, they disagree with each other quite vehemently, but often it can get personal and it's about people's motives and, and, and so on. But, you know, as someone, you know, this is a quote which I, I strongly agree with. If they attack one personally, it means they have not one single political argument left. Of course, <laughs> Margaret Thatcher herself, and I agree with that. So, firstly, I'm going to do a slight lefty bit, but I'll get that out of the way. I mean, come on, if I'm going to be asked to come here, might as well do that. As a wise man once said, when the regulation, therefore, is in favour of the workman, it is always just and equitable, but it is sometimes otherwise when in favour of the masters. And here's another one. The third and last duty of the sovereign or commonwealth is that of erecting and maintaining those public institutions and those public works, which, though they may be in the highest degree advantageous to a great society, are, however, 
of such a nature that the profit could never repay the expense to any individual or small number of individuals, and which it therefore cannot be expected that any individual or small number of individuals should erect or maintain. That notorious lefty, of course, was Adam Smith hey. himself. Hey. Comrade Adam Smith. Now, he'd be a rampant lefty by today's standards. But enough, enough trolling. I've got the trolling out the way now. Um, now, what I want to do is talk about where we agree, or lots of us, I would imagine, agree. Now, like many of you, I agree with David Cameron, or rather, the incarnation of David Cameron in 2002, who said, I ask the Labour government not to return to retribution and war on drugs. Because what a tragedy that this incarnation is no more. I can think of few more ill-conceived monstrous government policies in so many ways, in terms of the calamity it has inflicted on so many lives globally, than the so-called war on drugs. What are the consequences of this authoritarian enterprise by the state? Well, let's think about it. Because, you know, there's a quote sometimes attributed to Albert Einstein, I don't know whether correctly or not, which is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And the war on drugs sums that up, I think, to a T. The countless deaths in Mexico alone since 2006, it is estimated that 100,000 people have died and maybe 20,000 more are missing. A violent conflict in Mexico where drug cartels murder their victims in ways similar to ISIS, as we have so horrifically seen. An entire industry left to be run by criminal enterprises who are spreading chaos the world over. Drug abuse far higher than when this so-called war on drugs began many decades ago. Impure substances allowed, of course, to circulate with such damage inflicted on people across the earth. The, we can't get tax revenues, of course, from this huge multi-billion pound uh, industry. Mass incarceration, uh, which has, co has been the consequence. Now, According to the United Nations, the consequences as well as all of those have been everything from vast corruption and political destabilisation in Afghanistan and West Africa to the spread of HIV in Russia. And also it's collided with racism. Because in this country, you are six times more likely to be stopped and searched for possession of uh, cannabis than if you are white in London. And if you are found with cannabis or cocaine on you, you are far more likely to be charged. Now the consequences for people, if they are charged and are prosecuted even for possession of drugs, can be crippling for the rest of their lives, for their career, their job prospects. Now this isn't the likes, I'm afraid, of people in cabinet. Some of whom, let's be honest, have experimented, to say the least, in their youth. But they are themselves enforcing laws which are criminalising the behaviour of others who suffer when they are behaving in just the same way as members of that cabinet. I think it's grotesque and it's an injustice. And I'm glad the Adam Smith Institute is amongst those who have taken this government to task courageously because often on these issues, certainly, what the Adam Smith Institute has done so commendably is take on issues which are not popular often or very divisive and don't have the support, certainly, of the likes of the Daily Mail. But given the disaster of such policies, we don't talk about them enough. And it's absolutely correct that the Adam Smith Institute has done so. And they should be commended for taking on the government's ill-judged, wrong-headed attempt to make the drugs laws even more restrictive than they already are. This clamp down on legal highs and poppers which will ruin Friday nights for so many gay men. <laughs> <laughs> and then, another issue, of course, immigration and refugees. Mm -hmm. Now, the Adam Smith Institute and others in this room will agree, I'm sure, with me, that politicians and others often scapegoat those from different countries for their own failures, for their own problems. They have prob failures to address the everyday, everyday needs of so many people in this country. <clears throat> now, Sam himself wrote about refugees. I'm not aware of any mainstream moral theory that does not tell us that all humans matter, not just the ones who look like us or who were born near us. When people are dying from drowning and suffocation, we have to accept that we are not the only ones who matter. Now that humanity is something that I commend absolutely. I went to the Calais camps and I met people who have fled the most unbearable, unspeakable violence. Violence which, touch wood, nobody in this room will ever 
have to experience. You know, people whose dads were shot dead by the Taliban, people whose fellow villagers were burned to death in Sudan, whether it be uh, people who fled Eritrea, a dictatorship as brutal almost as that of North Korea, uh, whether it be those who fled the barrel bombs of the Assad dictatorship in Syria. These are people who have shared humanity with us and actually what separates them most of all isn't their race or religion or their culture or their language but the violence that they have suffered and these are people who are often being attacked now in a way uh, which is I think a quite useful or convenient attempt for politicians to wash their hands of the problems that they have failed to address and so much easier to blame those from other countries instead. Another issue, the Adam and Smith, Smith Institute has been commendable on civil liberties and again I stand with them on that defence, that proud defence of people's individual freedoms, like, for example, the surveillance bill, a threat to the civil liberties of the people of this country. Uh, Charlotte Bowyer, uh, who works for the Adam Smith Institute, rightly called it a snoopers charter. Now, for standing up to so-called anti-terrorism measures, where we grant terrorists victories all too often by surrendering the rights and freedoms that our ancestors fought for <coughs> at such cost, at such sacrifice. Now, you have damned this institute, the Cameron, for the decision to, as you put it, creep towards a police state, correctly <coughs> arguing, as you said, that Britain plans to make citizens fearful of their own justice system by imp further empowering police to confiscate passports and detain travellers without clear evidence of wrongdoing. These are threats to individual liberty and individual freedom, the growth of an authoritarian statism. And I stand in solidarity with the Adam Smith Institute in making what is often a deeply unpopular case for civil liberties. It's not something you get applause for out there. And it's often portrayed as, you know, sandal wearing, muesli eating, Islington Easters. But the reality is, these are freedoms that our ancestors fought for. And it is a tragedy when the people who came before us, who secured our rights and freedoms, at such sacrifice and cost, often tortured and demonised and humiliated and even killed for, sacrifice, for, for fighting for our freedoms, that we allow without even a whimper some of those freedoms to be chipped away. So it's crucial because we owe it to our ancestors to keep fighting to defend those freedoms and those liberties as the likes of the Adam Smith Institute has done. Now here's another, I think, possible point of agreement, and that is on the issue of the basic income. Now basic income, I mean, we might disagree on, on the details or the nuances or the implementation, but that principle is absolutely, of course, sound. Rather than having this complex social security system where you get people often who need support who aren't getting it, where you get stigmatisation, where you get a sanctions regime, and just to explain partly because we don't talk about you know, things like sanctioning and how they work, and I'll give you an example, a 60 year old man called Stephen Taylor in Manchester, where, near where I'm from, I'm a plastic northern, I sold it out my north, northern roots, but he's Stephen Taylor and he's an army veteran and he, and he'd, he's desperately looking for work and if you're 60 years old and out of work, it's really hard. It's really tough, but he was trying his best. And this six-year-old man, he was, uh, he was uh, selling poppies for the Royal Legion. Selling poppies for maimed and injured former comrades of his. And he was selling these poppies at a supermarket where he applied for work that was unsuccessful. This six-year-old man had his benefits stopped, sanctioned, on the basis his volunteering for the Royal Legion showed he wasn't trying hard enough to look for work. Now, I think examples like that show our social security system in so many ways isn't working. And I think a basic income, simplifying social security, where everybody has a right of citizenship, receives a basic support uh, income uh, from the state, is a way of dealing with so many problems we have. Work, of course, is becoming more insecure. Uh, te the technological revolution is something, of course, we should embrace. But the danger is technology, uh, increasingly it's projected, could end up destroying more jobs than it creates. As work, if it becomes more insecure and more precarious, then it e makes ever greater sense to have a basic income. And it can help in so many different ways. Think of the entrepreneur, the risk-taking entrepreneur, to have that basic stability <coughs> and security as they innovate. Now, that is something which all of us, I think, 
Certainly myself, it's something I've been on a journey on and been looking at, but basic income is a fascinating idea whose time has come and people on both right and left, I think, can unite behind that principle. And finally, the land value tax. Here's another. Absolutely. Oh, they love the land value tax. A typical London audience. They're paying for the land value tax out there. That's all they want to hear. Out of everything I suggested, it's the land value tax you love most. Anyway, the land value tax. No, but this makes absolute perfect sense. I mean, controversially. I don't know if I, um, this is too right wing for you, but you know, we could talk <laughs> about replacing stamp duty, uh, which I don't think is a good tax, mm -hmm. and council tax, which is a regressive tax with a form of a land value tax. I think that could be a progressive way of dealing with the issue that we tax the value of the land, uh, and I think that is a system, a form of tax justice, if you like. We can all become fellow tax justice campaigners <laughs> together. <laughs> Let's go and occupy some. No, no, we, we don't. Have any. <laughs> <laughs> but again, again, common ground. I mean, listen, what do we disagree on? <laughs> <laughs> and this, this is the point. I think this. I, yeah. <laughs> Don't film any of this, no joking. Um, <laughs> it's going to turn into a gif, that isn't it? Anyway, but I, I just think, I just think, I think what's interesting about it is because you know when I was asked to do this and find common ground, I thought I would struggle. But actually, it's interesting because we have a very polarised political debate, of course, um, in this country, and there are much we disagree with, and passionately so. But I do think it's fascinating when we can find issues of agreement between people whose political traditions seem infinitely divorced from one another. And I think that's a fascinating thing to do. These are all issues from the calamity, in my view, and in the view of so many of you here, of the war on drugs, to the idea of a land value tax. These are issues which have been condemned to the fringes, but I think we should be more vocal about. And it does take courage and determination because these are not often popular issues and the likes of uh, some of the more uh, uh, less open to debate sections of the media might not be very uh, happy with it. But I think these are issues that should be raised. So on those issues, certainly, I will commend the Adam Smith Institute. But I suppose it's a plea that let's continue having these discussions and this form of dialogue, that we will disagree strongly and passionately on lots and lots of issues. But I think politics does need, as I said at the beginning, a bit more humanity. That even though we often don't agree on issues, that doesn't mean, if you like, we can't accept the good faith of those who we disagree with. So it is a great honour to be here tonight, and I look forward to speaking to you all some more, and I look forward to manning the barricades with so many of you <laughs> on these issues. So comrades and friends, thank you very much. much we agree on, I have something that I think you're going to get a lot of use out of, which is an Adam Smith Institute talk. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> the only reason I came. Thank you. Um, I, hope, I hope you will all join us for another couple of glasses of wine. We'll be going to Low, Slow and Juke, the pub down the road afterwards. Uh, thanks again for coming, and thank you Owen so much for joining us. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> 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 <laughs>